Today is the feast day of the seven sorrows of our Blessed Lady, the last of our Friday evenings of recollection for Lent. After Mass, as usual, there's a supper laid on in Tuft Hall. I hope that you'll join us and that you'll stay for the stations of with our Sorrowful Mother this evening, the conclusion of the Sorrowful Mother Novena, the meditation and benediction. And thine own soul a sword shall pierce. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The feast day of our Sorrowful Mother, especially in Passion Tide, is in effect the very feast of sorrow itself. So you see how beautifully the altar is decorated, and yet at the same time the color purple reminds us of the passion and of sorrow, penance, and of grief. The Feast of the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady is at the same time an embodiment of both the virtue and the gift of fortitude. By fortitude, you know, it's especially we think of it as the confirmation virtue, but it's to cover everything in life. By fortitude, we do the difficult good. You see that in all seven, of our Blessed Lady's sorrows, the three of the childhood of Christ and the four of his passion, the prophecy of Simeon in the temple, the flight into Egypt, the three days loss in the temple, and then the way of the cross, the crucifixion, the deposition or the taking down from the cross, the Pieta, also called, and then finally the burial of Christ. But all through Christ's life, especially his passion and his death, you see his mother. And because Our Lady suffered everything that her son suffered, and then suffered as a mother herself, you see how her sorrows were doubled unto eternity. They say that the, the death of a thousand martyrs wouldn't equal Our Blessed Lady's suffering. And yet at the same time, that shows us her remarkable, miraculous strength, the strength of her sorrows, her fortitude. And Our Lady is everywhere in the story of the Passion of Christ these days, whether you could read it in Scripture or not, you could find it in some pious book, private revelation, or devout meditation. Our Lady is always there, and she's helping, she's consoling, Sometimes she's con conjoling and converting and counseling. Our Lady tried to help Judas, you know. Judas was sent to her by, by our Lord, but she was unsuccessful. And St. Peter, after having betrayed Christ, knew that our blessed Lord had forgiven him, at least he hoped that he did, and yet he was inconsolable. To whom did he turn on Good Friday night? To our Blessed Lady, in the desolation and the tears of his heart. Joseph of Arimathea, we looked at him the other evening. He's a wonderful example of somebody who was, shall we say, as most of us are, a work in progress. He's the patron saint of those who come to Christ late. And who are held back for lack of courage, the cowardly souls even, and certainly fearful. We could see today our Blessed Lady of Sorrows praying for Joseph of Arimathea. She knew he had a job to do, and yet he wasn't saying a word. It was almost three o'clock. Just as on the way to the cross, she prayed for Simon of Cyrene to be brave, see, brave, strong enough, willing enough to take up the cross in obedience to the soldiers, in obedience to Christ. And for Dismas there, hanging on the cross, she remembered him as a boy, for him to be converted finally at the end and go to heaven. And so he was. All of this, these thoughts come to me today because this is 
the Feast of the Sorrowful Mother is the second anniversary, which we have to keep in this church with grateful, with grateful sentiments of devotion, how protected we were during the imposition of that lockdown. The lockdown that was really more in people's minds and in their fear-bent wills than ever, than ever in some sort of an official declaration, much less the imposition of a true or a valid law. And this is where Joseph of Arimathea and his friend, who is privileged as well to participate in the taking down of Christ from the cross, the Pieta Nicodemus, this is where these two types are to be seen and they abound. Back then, two years ago, everybody, especially people in authority, were falling over themselves with, to comply, not even with what was actually required, and very often churches were specifically exempt from all of this business, but nevertheless, because of fear and because of that incipient brainwashing, they just bent immediately, folded like Peter in the courtyard of the high priest. Under, under what? Torture? No. It was under the questioning of a maid girl. And nothing more than that. How happy and how encouraged the one worlders, the communist COVID revolutionaries, must have been to rub their hands together with glee. All of the Christians of the world <laughs> close their churches and join everyone else in cowardly fear. And so, for so many churches, even, and even Catholic churches that, that are left, the holy water was taken away. Why did they do that? And it stayed away for months. And they had that tape on the floor as to which where you had to walk as though you were going to, to Walmart or something instead of the temple of the Lord. And many churches were simply closed, and others had canceled masses for at least a while. And then there was limited seating that was imposed. And in some places, they made it to be by reservation only. And social distancing, of course, goes without saying. And some people I heard of one, once in one state, some people were actually turned away from going to Mass. Not because of any law, but because of fear and cowardliness. How unworthy. And the only thing I've ever heard in the way of an excuse was somebody who said, well, would you pay the, who's going to pay the fines? Would you pay the fines? Because of fines? Because of a question of money? You would do something like that? Seriously? However, are you going to make out when it comes to the next stage? When the horsemen actually ride into town? Fines. Silly things then. Even some priests it must be almost sacrilegious, purifying their fingers with rubbing alcohol between each and every Holy Communion, making up a new ceremony in the Mass. Caving, people would call it, caving to COVID communism, or putting tissue over the crucifix on Good Friday when the faithful came up to kiss it. It's all fear. It's a fear that brings people into line and served as the first efficacious step of the communist revolution. What a mess. What's the antidote? I'll tell you the antidote. The way of the cross. The sorrowful mysteries of the rosary. Even just sitting quietly, if you could at church or at least at home, and meditating upon the sorrows of our Blessed Mother. Those seven swords are covered now, but the seven swords you see in her immaculate heart. There is healing there, and there is enlightenment, and there is the infusion of strength from above. Scripture tells us it was Joseph of Arimathea, a word about him to conclude. He plays a very big role in the passion, because in the traditional way, when the passion is sung, the very last part of the passion is taken separately to serve as a gospel for that day. The Passion stands alone, and then and there's a, and the gospel is always about Joseph of Arimathea. The Church wants us to meditate 
upon him, to see ourselves a bit in him, and to understand what he did. He went to Pilate, of course, to ask permission to take Christ's body from the cross in the place of execution, and he provided his own tomb for our Lord's burial. You would think that such a privilege would have fallen to one of the twelve, would have fallen to someone who made at least a public profession of faith in Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But no, this is one of the many consoling. You see, the devotion to the passion of Jesus and Mary is such a consolation for us, especially in times of cowardice and of confusion or just plain of grief. The consoling lesson of the passion that this honor fell to a man who was afraid to accept Christ and his doctrine to be known as being interested in our Lord's teaching. And it was so full of human respect. That's the killer for souls today. So full of human respect is to come to Jesus only, Scripture says, under cover of darkness. It was one of the first fruits of the Passion that when Joseph had seen the patience of our Lord and the nobility of our Lord there, hanging on the cross, and the fortitude of his mother who just stood there those three hours, her heart broken again and again. When he saw those things, he made a public declaration of his faith in Jesus Christ. And then, and from then on, he was no longer afraid. We need to learn from this that any kind of a meditation, a consideration, about the sorrows of Jesus and Mary is enough to transform weak and sinful hearts like ours. How are you going to be ready for the next time they come back? Because they're certainly coming back. We can be transformed from passive sympathizers into what? Into <laughs> courageous disciples of Jesus and of Mary and faithful servants of Almighty God. Nobody could possibly meditate on these sorrows we honor today on the Feast of Sorrows and throughout all of Lent and Passion Tide without being moved to imitate them. And our Blessed Lady has made so many and such rich promises to those who are devoted to the seven sorrows. Know them. Think of them. Point them out to yourself and to others even when you do the Rosary in the whole of the course of the year, and the next time you're troubled, confused, tempted to cave, like some unworthy non-Christian, spend a little time with her there at the foot of the cross. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.